Why is it that the same pharmaceutical corporations are able to sell the same drug in Mexico for a much, much, much smaller price? Wow, how did that happen? Is it magic, Ben? saw in politics there is no such thing as a free lunch well apparently there are a lot of people out there who believe there is such a thing as free medicine and the way that they are basically making the case yeah it's crazy all these other countries where uh the medication is like medication pharmaceutical prices are controlled by the government because they're engaging in like mass purchases because they have a socialized structure for healthcare. in all of these nations it's just they they're operating with uh i guess pure magic is that Big Pharma in the United States makes a lot of money. Now, there are a lot of problems with Big Pharma, for sure. There are drugs that are really not great for people that are marketed as though they are amazing for people. Right? The most obvious example being Oxycontin. But it is also true that every single drug you take was developed by Big Pharma. Every single medicine you take was developed by- That's not true. That's not even remotely true. Every single drug you take was developed by scientists working in publicly funded research facilities in colleges and universities. <laughs> Not a single aspect of this is, is, is like the idea that it's only capitalists that are, uh, you know, and, and people who are uh, operating under the profit motive uh, that are making these new drugs is silly. It's ahistoric. There are plenty of incredible examples of people uh, developing uh, patents and then selling it off for one dollar like insulin, uh, antibiotics. It's just complete nonsensical capitalist hokum to lie like this okay they're lying to you hoping that you don't second guess it ben has uh, been doing this in perpetuity every single right wing and even a lot of liberals engage in this lie it's bullshit okay so let's just start there eh, wrong that's not true publicly funded research is what guides a lot of medical innovation the actual funding r&d costs Inside of pharmaceutical companies, the broad majority of those co uh, costs are not actually on new novel or novel chemical compound development. It's actually just figuring out ways of extending the patents that they hold on to. They use a lot of their money. They use a lot of their funds to capture a patent. And then after they take the patent, uh, they try to find new ways of extending that patent, new delivery mechanisms, slow release mechanisms, things of that nature. Uh, most of that is the is the real cost of R&D. They do not invent the drugs. A pharmaceutical CEO has never invented a fucking drug. They have invented new ways of extending. Even they don't do that themselves, but they fund people that invent new ways of extending patents. That's the goal. Worked in research for a university. Very little new compounds are funded by pharma. They use the majority of their funds to find new use for the same drug. Exactly. But even then, even then, not only is a lot of the novel chemical compounds funded by publicly funded research, okay, that they, that uh, capitalist pharmaceutical companies uh, seize on and purchase, but, but having said that, a lot of people will say the United States of America, innovator in, in uh, uh, medicine, not true. The United States of America, in spite of all the public funded and privately funded medical research is not the number one in uh, novel chemical compound development per capita, okay? That is not true. Other countries that have higher levels of public funding are significantly more efficient at developing novel chemical compounds. They work with the limited funds that they have. But remember, the goal of a capitalist is not to innovate to better people's lives. The goal of a capitalist is to innovate to find new profit vectors. That's it. It's to constantly find new and innovative ways of creating uh, more shareholder value. That's it. Increasing shareholder value. That is the only job. That is their fiduciary responsibility. Let's move on. By Big Pharma. So if Big Pharma is responsible for Oxycontin, they're also responsible for Advil. If Big Pharma is responsible for the mRNA vaccine that you didn't want to take, Big Pharma is also responsible for all of the chemotherapy medications that your mother is taking. So Big Pharma is responsible for all of those things. And the medical None of these things uh, Big Pharma is responsible for. Ben Shapiro is lying and saying Big Pharma when the real answer is government-funded, publicly-funded medical research happening in facilities, okay? There is obviously private funding that happens in these facilities as well, of course. Most of it is still voluntary donations, though. 
Uh, and then beyond that, it's uh, purchasing the patent after the fact. But that comes after the fact, okay? That's after a patent has been developed. Most of this stuff, most of, uh, you know, the, the novel chemical compounds that are uh, being created, that are being found in these research facilities are still absolutely kept up with public funding. Advances in the United States have led to a tremendous ex expansion of life expectancy in the United States. That's not true. Cuba's life expectancy is higher than the United States. Cuba has uh, better outcomes, better healthcare outcomes than the United States, in spite of being a tiny fucking island that has been under constant embargo by the United States of America post the Cuban Revolution. Uh, so even on that front, that is completely wrong. Healthcare across the board and life expectancy across the board is an, is obviously a much more holistic number. It's very difficult to arrive at it by simply saying we have better medicine and that's why our life expectancy is higher. That is not the case, of course. There is a, There are a multitude of different factors that apply to understanding life expectancy. Uh, walkable cities, access to public transit, cleaner air, better food, less subsidies for corn, for example. Uh, there is no... One, your diet, your national diet overall, uh, and how uh, expensive it is to eat healthy. These are all fa these are all actual factors that that uh, go into uh, figuring out life expectancy. So it's not exactly a great metric uh, be, uh, if you're going to tackle like one issue. But even on that front, the United States life expectancy is significantly worse than other comparable developing nations or even developed nations, especially developed nations, but even developing nations. So Ben's not even right on that front either. The, the five-year cancer survival rate in the United States is much higher than anywhere else on Earth. The reason being, we have better medicines than anywhere else on Earth. It also also wrong. Like I said, the only thing that Ben Shapiro can do in a healthcare situation is basically cherry pick data. It's not even all types of cancer that he's talking about. There are specific uh, there are specific types of cancers that the U.S. medical innovation is is better at, but that doesn't mean that we have a higher life expectancy. U.S. is seventy seven point twenty eight, Canada eighty one. Um, but uh, ultimately, he's not right. Um, and just because someone is good at like ass cancer, let's say. Someone is good at like uh, saving people from dick cancer or ass cancer or brain cancer or whatever the fuck doesn't mean that our healthcare system is actually better than other nations. It is not. OK, that doesn't even mean that we have better medicine. For example, Cuba has had a lung cancer vaccine for many years. This is something to consider. This lung cancer vaccine was created on a fucking tiny island and has existed for a long time, as a matter of fact. Americans with lung cancer, due to our uh, political stance against the tiny island nation, the Cigar Island, um, won't allow people to go and get that. So happens to be that we develop a huge number of medical patents right here in the United States. Well, the reason for that is because the United States, when it comes to drug pricing, is maybe the last country on earth that actively allows patients and doctors to buy drugs at the price that pharma is selling the drugs at, as opposed to using the government. This is a very fun way to describe the situation that is horrific. Ben is right, but he's using, he is uh, very greasy in the way that he's describing it. Remember, I talked about this earlier. The United States is the only nation on earth where big pharmaceutical purchases were illegal until recently. Uh, it, it, they were not susceptible to price negotiations. The government made it so that Medicare and VA and Medicaid could not negotiate drug prices when they're purchasing massive quantities of it. That is not a thing that exists anywhere else on the planet, okay? It, is, it was illegal. Now, Ben, of course, is a gigantic piece of shit, so he has to reframe it like it's a good thing. Let me explain. If you're familiar with Costco or Sam's Club, right? If you're familiar with wholesale purchases, you already know when you go and buy an entire fucking tub of ice cream, that shit's going to come down to a much cheaper uh, ice cream per gallon for you, the consumer, than actually going to the store and getting a pint of ice cream. Or uh, what is going to be even more expensive than that is go to a uh, ice cream shop and get a scoop of ice cream, okay? Because when you're buying a tub of ice cream, uh, it's, it's, it's cheaper, uh, it's cheaper to purchase it in bulk. It's cheaper to consume it in bulk. It's cheaper to sell it in bulk. So you get a deal. Everybody loves a deal. You know who doesn't love a deal? The American government. Every other country on this planet 
every other nation on this planet, given that they have uh, some kind of socialized medicine or, or uh, at least like has to purchase uh, a lot of drugs to bring it into their country, will engage in bargaining with pharmaceutical corporations. This is part of the reason why patents, international patents, are oftentimes held by different companies. International patents are separate than patents in the United States of America and Canada and patents in Japan. Japan is like one of the few exceptions for this. Most, com most companies will leverage their prices. Most companies will leverage their prices and have international patents, and then they'll hold on to U.S. distribution patents because the U.S. distribution patents is literally better for them and more costly to the consumer because of how costly it is to the consumer because of what I just described to you, okay, for this specific reason, because we are cash cows and we have no way of changing this system. This is some of the most straightforward lying that I've ever seen Ben do sometimes. I'm not sure if he understands or not. He knows that he's been lying and misleading in the whole damn video. No, this is something that Ben used to do all the time. I don't think a lot of you guys remember, but like before the, the cancel, uh, before cancel culture, culture wars and all this shit, Steven Crowder, Ben Shapiro, right when commentators used to uh, uh, put forward these American Enterprise Institute backed talking points on a regular basis. Uh, there was a time and place when I used to argue these talking points on a regular basis as well. We haven't done it in a long time because Republicans kind of realize that this is a losing issue when you're basically trying to tell people that like your drug prices should be expensive because you're subsidizing the rest of the planet or whatever. Like that's a really dumb thing to say. It also goes against the America first principles. So a lot of them dropped it. Uh, a lot of them don't really talk about it. They'd much rather talk about issues that they think they can win on like trans uh, kids or, or gay people or uh, climate change is a hoax or whatever the fuck. But this is classic. This is classic Ben Shapiro. I have addressed a lot of these talking points a million times over. You can probably find older videos of me addressing Ben saying these lies before. Anyway. To cram down particular pricing. Now, this has been a bugaboo. The government cramming down particular pricing is bullshit. If anything, the government has restricted itself from purchasing, uh, uh, purchasing or bargaining at the point of purchase bulk medication that they're purchasing for socialized aspects of the medicine that they offer to the citizens, Medicare, Medicaid, and Veterans Affairs uh, being the three that I have talked about before. Bullshit. Ben is trying to reframe that to make it seem like it's a positive thing. Oh, but like you get to negotiate your prices with your doctors. Bullshit. Nobody does that. Nobody doctor shops. Nobody fucking uh, medicine shops because, and Ben should know this because he's big capitalism boy, there's inelastic demand. If you don't get insulin and you have diabetes, you're going to die. That's it. You have to get the diabetes medication or you're going to fucking die. Therefore, you just suck it up and you pay for whatever the fuck uh, you can to get the diabetes medication, okay? For a lot of politicians because they look at Canada, or they look at Germany, or they look at Europe, or any place else on earth, and they say, well, they're buying those American drugs for far less than we are paying for those American drugs. This is what led yesterday the Biden administration to, through the Inflation Reduction Act, that had nothing to do with inflation reduction. Okay, stop crying about this. Uh, if, if, if parts of the Inflation Reduction Act are actually lowering government's uh, uh, purchase uh, or giving government more power to bargain at the point of purchase with uh, pharmaceutical companies, that quite literally is reducing inflation. Inflation is, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, the cost of goods uh, and, and uh, the cost of goods increasing overall. This is directly reducing inflation, okay? Just understand, Ben is lying to his audience once again. There is nothing more inflation reducing than giving the government the power to reduce pharmaceutical prices. What the fuck? What is it supposed to do? Maybe you can complain and say Inflation Reduction Act. Like, they gave, uh, you know, money to, to some uh, green energy initiatives. Like, how is that reducing prices or whatever? You can, you can try to make that argument, but, like, this is directly lowering the price of pharmaceuticals. It is lo it's, it's inflation reduction. That's what it is. At all. It turns out that pretty much the entire thing was about giving away money for green boondoggles and also apparently oh, screwing up doing the drug it. Yep, There it is. Yesterday, the U.S. government named 10 drugs that will be subject to the first ever price negotiations by Medicare, taking aim at some of the most widely used and costliest medicines 
in the I country, grab according right, to the Wall Street Journal. At stake is arguably the government's strongest effort to date to tackle high drug costs if drug makers can't persuade courts to scuttle the negotiating powers that Medicare was granted last year. On the list of targeted medicines announced by the Biden administration, Tuesday are treatments for cancer, diabetes, and heart disease that can cost tens of thousands of dollars a year or more, including the blood thinner Eliquis and diabetes treatment Jardians. Medicare spent $50.5 billion on those drugs last year, according to J.P. Morgan Chase. The 10 drugs include many drugs fighting diabetes. There's an arthritis drug from Amgen called Enbrel that's on the list. There are, there's a psoriasis drug from Johnson & Johnson. Stacey Dutzina, a health policy professor at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, said this is a major step toward reducing drug spending. And of course, Joe Biden is very excited about all of this. He says we pay m- way more for prescription drugs than any other economy on the world, in, in the world. And here he was yesterday explaining that if it's sold in Chicago, you are paying more money than if you are buying it in Toronto or Paris. A drug company that makes a drug here in America, if it's sold in Chicago, you can buy the same drug in Toronto or Paris cheaper than you can buy it in Toronto. I mean, it's in, in Chicago. Okay, well, that's true. But the reason that that's true is because basically the United States has allowed a bunch of other countries to free ride off the prices that Americans are paying. So what exactly would the downstream effects of this be? Well, according to the Wall Street Journal, the positive downstream effects would be lower prices. Those would take effect in 2026. Medicare would save an estimated $25 billion a year by 2031. The savings would mostly go to Medicare because it pays the bulk of the cost of the drugs. The reductions wouldn't directly affect the price patients pay at the pharmacy counter, but the price cuts would have an indirect impact on people spending. Medicare plans to use the savings to put a $2,000 annual cap on how much members have to pay out of pocket for drugs starting in 2025. So it sounds like an unalloyed good, right? Everything is great. It's awesome. There's only one problem, which is that medical innovation in the United States is about to crater. And when the government can cram down pricing in any particular area and remove the profit margin from the, from the actual pricing mechanism, that means people are not going to invest the kinds of money that are necessary in order to create the drugs in the first place. In the same way that rent control decreases people building and constructing, because why would you build a new apartment knowing there's no profit in it? The investment in the biotech sphere is going to utterly dry up if the government via Medicare continues there to cram is. down. Okay, everything is wrong. Everything that Ben said is wrong. Um, Medical innovation, medical innovation. The point about medical innovation is wrong. I wasn't even here for this part. I was literally looking for Advil. But I suspect he talked about uh, the European prices actually subsidizing America's, uh, uh, or American, sorry, American medical, uh, American pharmaceutical purchases are actually subsidizing European prices, I assume. This is a American Enterprise Institute talking point. As I mentioned before, uh, it is completely, objectively a falsehood. Companies operate on the profit motive, okay? Europeans are not freeloading. They're not freebooting on pharmaceutical prices because Americans are actually paying more. It's a really, really, really fucked up situation. They are still turning a profit when they sell to Europe because if a drug is not profitable to sell, capitalist corporations will simply stop selling them. That is the reality. My friends, that is the scary reality that we, even with the uh, low-ass pharmaceutical prices that European markets pay for, that uh, governments all around the nation, all around the world pay for, those companies are still turning a profit, okay? And no, it's not because they are getting subsidized by the American purchasers, that is precisely why I said some of these companies have separate pat. Every single drug has separate patents, separate distribution patents. Okay, every single drug has it. Sometimes a company doesn't even have the same patent for the American distribution and the international distribution. So how could they ever turn around and subsidize if another company is the one who is selling internationally? Okay. Also, the other side of this is like, how are you an America first Republican guy if you're saying that America should subsidize the rest of the planet? That doesn't make any dang sense to me. Okay? The second part of this argument is that uh, because Ben has to be a demon and because he has to be a capitalist uh, charlatan, he has to turn around and try and claim that there is a negative consequence of your grandmother buying drugs cheaper now. Okay, he has to make something up. So he turns around and lies about R&D. Well, 
Ding, ding, ding. Good luck. Hassan Hassanavi Piker is on the job. I've already explained this. The United States is not the leader in novel chemical compound development. All novel chemical compounds, pretty much damn near the entirety of the uh, field of medicine is, is, uh, is happening. All the medical innovation that we're talking about is happening in publicly funded institutions. Okay? It's mostly publicly funded. As a matter of fact, when it is publicly funded, it is more efficient. Turns out, novel chemical compound development per capita is not number one in the United States of America. Turns out, novel chemical compound development uh, is, is better in other countries, including, I think, Switzerland. I forget where it is. What? Imagine streaming on Twitch and not doing it for profit and then use it as an argument for profit while doing an ad break of the hour. Uh, actually, thank you, Chatter. You cooked me a little bit, but I had forgotten to run the top of the hour ad break, so I'm going to run it right now. How do you even measure innovation? Well, I like I told you, novel chemical compound development. Okay? That is how you measure medical innovation. Who is finding a new drug? Who is finding a new chemical compound that is going to be used in a drug? Okay? Novel ways and innovative ways of serving the top of the hour ad break also happen in the chat. Chat is probably better at novel ad break debates, uh, ad break segues per capita than I am. So, good job, chatter. Here's the three-minute ad break now. If you no longer want to see that ad, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. Uh, you can also get gifted a sub. If you're lucky, use the three-minute ad break now. Yes, most medical innovation and biomedical research happens at public universities or private institutes with public grants. Exactly. And not only that, but in other countries where uh, medicine is funded predominantly by the public in a higher percentage, they are apparently more innovative than the United States of America. They are more efficient uh, in the United, uh, than the United States of America in generating novel chemical compounds. So, that's one. That's number one. Just remember, it's completely made up. Ben is lying to you. He is lying through his teeth. Completely lying. Which is that medical innovation in the United States is about to crater. And when the government can cram down pricing in any particular area and remove the profit margin from the, from the actual pricing mechanism, that means people are not going to invest the kinds of money that are necessary in order to... Bullshit. As I already said. Bullshit. It's publicly funded research. Create the drugs in the first place. In the same way that rent control decreases people building and constructing, because why would you build a new apartment knowing there's no profit in it? The investment in the biotech sphere is going to utterly dry up if the government... Once again, absolutely bullshit. I'll give you an example. Places where there are far more restrictions on pricing of new housing units actually yield better outcomes and have been able to combat homelessness significantly better than the United States of America. The reality is that the for-profit housing sector is precisely the reason why we have so many homeless people everywhere. Uh, I will give another European example once again because Europe is both gay and socialist and also uh, La La Land where magic happens. Simply, we cannot do this in the United States of America. But Vienna comes to mind. Uh, the the uh, capital of, of Austria has a has has been incredibly innovative in this wonderful uh, new thing that isn't so new called public housing. 65% of the homes in Vienna are publicly owned. They are public housing uh, and they have uh, they're they're perfectly adequate. They're great. Uh, and you know people love that shit. They are incredibly affordable and therefore they have significantly less homelessness. Anyway, so there it is. The idea that government intervention is actually bad or government regulation is actually bad is a silly one. <sighs> Via Medicare continues to cram down policies like this one. By the way, the policy itself is absolutely wild. I mean, the way that they are cramming this thing down is that they go to the companies, that the Medicare goes to the companies that produce the drugs, and then they tell them that they are now going to be subjected to this sort of arbitrary choice where they, where they pick your drug out of the lineup and they say, from now on, we are going to cram down a price on you. The this is such a funny fucking video. There is 0% chance that even the dumbest of hogs, okay, are going to watch this video and go, I agree with Ben Shapiro. 
You have to be the sweatiest neoliberal nerd on the fucking planet. You have to be the sweatiest Austrian economist on the planet. Uh, the sweatiest ANCAP libertarian, whatever the fuck, on the planet to watch a video like this and go, Ben is so right. Most hogs, I do not believe, agree with Ben Shapiro. America rocks, 1776. Any drug that is developed with a significant portion of taxpayer money should not allowed to be patented. Read the comments. Have you ever seen a YouTuber have such, uh, 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 such clarity in its comment section? This motherfucker's name is America Rock 1776. Go ahead. He gets it. Only the sweatiest fucking losers on r slash neoliberal will look at a video like this and go, actually, this is, uh, Ben is completely uh, correct here. He is doing the right thing. He's doing uh, God's bidding here. I get that R&D is done by American companies, but still there was no explanation why the same medicines cost less in Mexico, Canada, and other countries. That is the part that doesn't add up. And a wizard did it is how it sounds in fact that everyone seems to avoid explaining this in a clear manner and jump to something else. Brilliant. That's fucking awesome. He's right. Why is it that the same pharmaceutical corporations are able to sell the same drug in Mexico for a much, much, much smaller price? Wow. How did that happen? Do you think that these big pharmaceutical CEOs are actually quite magnanimous? That they've decided, I do care about Mexicans more than I care about Americans, as a matter of fact. I love Mexico. I love Brazil. Brazil carayo, I say from my private jet as I stare down at the favelas and I decide that Brazil will pay and the people of Brazil will pay one-tenth the same price. Uh, one-tenth the price of the same exact pharmaceutical that Americans should pay. Okay? How does that work? Is it because they're nice? No, it's because they're still turning a profit when they sell to Brazil. They do. It's just the profit margins are unimaginable in America. That is the devastating fact. Do you understand that? I hope you understand that. That is the devastating fact, is that in the United States of America, they are just able to get away with price gouging you. Because all matter of price increases on an inelastic good with inelastic demand is price gouging, okay? That's it. And we do this in the field of real estate as well. We do this for housing as well. So it's kind of funny that Ben brought this up because I believe that housing is also an inelastic demand good. Let's continue. The CMS can only select drugs that have been on the market for a certain period of time. For instance, a small molecule drug, a product in pill form like aspirin, must have been on the market for nine years or more to be negotiation eligible, a biologic drug, a vaccine or a gene therapy must have been marketed for 13 years or more for eligibility. There are a couple of exemptions that drug makers can use. They can say that they're small biotechs and they manufacture like one drug or biologic drugs that have a high likelihood of getting biosimilar competition within a couple of years on the list. There's no reason to cram down the price. There's going to be somebody who's... He's saying that generics will come out and they will actually adjust pricing, except generics do come out. Just wait 13 years. Oh, just kidding. We dumped a fuck ton of funds into R&D at Pfizer and decided the patent has been extended for another nine years. Just wait. Come on. Come on. Just wait another nine years. Oh, at the end of that patent, they figured out another way of uh, another delivery mechanism. So just wait another nine years for the generics to come out. Why are we waiting for the free market to do its bidding when the free market is very clearly not allowing you to get these drugs cheaply oh you can't wait another nine years because you're fucking dead you're dead he's talking about copycat drugs not generics what what do you think a generic drug is what am i am i confused here generics are copycat drugs they still get patents but so similar function generics are the same chemical compounds being used in the original brand drug it's just that uh, the patent has been released so you can actually finally make copycat drugs. I'm, I'm so, I might be wrong. Maybe I'm, I'm like, maybe there's like a semantics uh, issue here. Chatter is correct. The example Ben is using is slightly different. What's the difference? Develops a generic, but a similar concept, small biotechs and they manufacture. Just keep quiet and listen. If you don't know what you're talking about, are you telling me that? Or are you telling that chatter that? Actually, like one drug. 
or biologic drugs that have a high likelihood of getting biosimilar competition within a couple of years on the list. There's no reason to cram down the price. There's going to be somebody who develops a generic. But the, this is the start of the negotiation process. Basically, they are notified by Medicare that they are now subject to a price cram down. And they have to decide then whether to enter into talks. If they choose not to, they would then face an excise tax scaling up to 95%. 95%. So they, they would still be able to sell their drug to Medicare, but Medicare would then claw back via the power of the federal government 95%. 95% of any income. Hell yeah. Fuck yeah. They should. That is if they don't agree to the terms and conditions that put, were put forward. Yeah, they should. I fucking love that. Go ahead, Ben. You've been a pharma skeptic uh, or your audience has been geared towards hating big pharma, which is understandable, and not for the good reasons like this one but instead for the bad reasons like, oh, the vaccines are bad. And now all of a sudden you are basically making a video saying, well, what about the profits of the big pharma executives? What about the profits of the pharmaceutical executives? Really? You think that's going to play well in your audience? Incredible stuff. Incredible stuff. Now I know a lot of Americans are stupid, my friends, but I don't even think they're that stupid because a lot of Americans are ill. A lot of Americans are sick. A lot of Americans due to that illness rely on medication so they know what that looks like that's part of the reason why they hate the pharmaceutical overlords that run our lives basically making the argument that your grandma should die so that executives can make millions is going to make people disagree with you real fucking quick yeah no matter how stupid people are even the dumbest person knows when they're being fucked okay to this degree this is a direct action reaction direct tangible consequence situation you are not going to be able to get away with lying in this situation to a broader audience from that drug, or they would have to leave Medicare or Medicaid altogether, which by the way, doesn't help patients on Medicare or Medicaid a whole hell of a lot. Ben, famously also, as, as some of his commenters even recognized, refused to tell you why Mexico gets to pay way less for the same fucking drugs. What is it, is it magic, Ben? Is it the magnanimous nature of pharmaceutical providers? Uh, pharmaceutical executives, sorry, big pharma? Do they like Australia more than they like us? Is that why they're giving uh, better deals to them? Or is it because they're engaging in collective bargaining? Is it because they're engaging in price bargaining at the point of purchase? There are places in, uh, when we're talking about socialized medicine, certain countries will literally refuse to pay the prices that big pharmaceutical corporations are demanding for their drugs. Those drugs get pushed out of the market then. They just don't buy it. In my opinion, in my opinion, there should be a punishment for such a thing. That every single government should be able to punish pharmaceutical corporations for refusing to sell at the price points that governments are engaging in in good faith when they're negotiating. If a government is negotiating in good faith and they're offering a price to purchase uh, in bulk the pharmaceuticals that you are selling, and you refuse to budge, you should withstand severe punishments. You should no longer be able to sell any drugs in that marketplace. They should be able to forcibly seize your medical, your R&D, your novel chemical compound research, and create uh, uh, very uh, low-cost alternatives. It is nutty and unimaginable that that is not the case. In certain situations, you know, Germany, for example, does this. They just don't buy it. They don't buy it. They don't buy the drug. Which means that Big Pharma does actually make a tidy profit on the drugs they do sell in those marketplaces. It's just not as wide a profit margin as they do in the United States of America. That's it. Assuming drug companies then enter into the talks, the final negotiated rate on the first set of drugs applies to the pharmacy counter starting January 1st, 2026. So what is the downstream effect of all of this? Well, here is the thing that people are not seeing. To develop a drug, yes, you're looking at the drug, you see it come across the counter, you're like, whoa, look at the sticker shock on that thing. That is, and it doesn't cost nearly that much to produce the drug. The amount of money that is put in R&D on drugs is insane. I mean, totally crazy. I know- He's gonna say FDA regulation is a big problem too. Clinical trial uh, expenses are a big problem. Um, that's why it's so expensive. Uh, I, I, I already know. Okay. Let's look at R&D and private pharmaceuticals. Okay. 
So, uh, even the Brookings Institute shows that the relationship between R&D spending and the supply of new drugs is modest. <clears throat> Remember, this is the Brookings Institute. Okay? The scope of the public sector's contribution to drug discovery and development identified in the study is somewhat overwhelming. Our analysis focused on identifying uh, HIN-funded research associated with the 356 drugs that were approved from 2010 to 2019, and there are 219 distinct biological targets. National Institutes of Health contributed to the new drugs approved by the FDA between 2010 and 2019. To damn near all of them. So, one trick that uh, capitalists play, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical corporations play, is R&D, where they say R&D, R&D, R&D. It's spending, we're spending so much money on R&D. Research and development for ways to ex extend patents on the same drug is not research and development for novel chemical compounds. This is how they lie to you. Most of the research and development in the private sector goes into new delivery mechanisms that end up extending the patent that you're holding on to. Okay? Understand that. It's bullshit. When they say R&D is, is what is the reason why these drugs are so expensive. It's bullshit. Those drugs have already been invented. And the distribution and the pilling, uh, you know, putting it in a fucking pill form or whatever, all of those costs are relatively low. You're just printing money at that point. Mr. Gonzalez, you're the CEO of AbbVie, which makes the cancer drug Imbruvica. Do you here's, know what the... Here's, a, here's another good example of this. The annual price of Imbruvica was for a patient taking the standard three pills per day in 2013. $130,000. Okay, we had 99766 What about today for those same three pills? Uh, I think it's 169,000. We have 181, but we can agree that there was a significant increase. Roughly in a matter of eight years, AbbVie more than doubled the price. Now, Mr. Gonzalez, how much money did AbbVie put directly into the research and development costs of Imbruvica before it hit the market in 2013? We acquired Imbruvica when it, uh, when it was launched, so it would have been the uh, the company that we acquired. Which so, we acquired the, we're cleaning my time. So, Abbey itself didn't spend any money to create Imbruvica. It was invented by a smaller company, Pharmacyclix, which you later acquired, correct? We paid $21 billion for the company, correct? It was expensive to acquire them. So, you paid fair market value for Pharmacyclix, but Abbey then doubled the price, presumably justified by its $2.45 billion investment. So did that investment make the drug new or better? Did it make it work more efficiently? Did it cure anybody? Or did they simply raise the price of the drug because they could, because if you don't have the drug, you die? In R&D, are there fewer side effects for patients now than there were in 2013? Well, we developed significant indications and expansions and other disease states. Are there for fewer side effects, sir? Uh, no, it has the same side effect profile. Okay. Mr. Gonzalez, do people need less of this medicine in Brivica to treat lymphoma now? Uh, no. So AbbVie took zero risk to develop this drug. You bought it approved for the market, knowing it would be profitable. You hiked the price to pay for R&D, but you haven't made the drug any better, even as you doubled the cost. I wrote an entire report on what is essentially the Imbruvica story. Big Pharma gobbles up a small innovative company, does nothing to improve the drug, but jacks up the price. Now, you told us that you spent $2.54 billion for R&D, for Imbruvica, even though the drug didn't get any better. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You spent $2.5 billion for R&D, but it was just to purchase the the innovative pharmaceutical uh, product creating smaller pharmaceutical company. So where is the R&D there? I'm so confused. This is why Ben Shapiro is a fucking liar. Okay? Better. 
Really, it was all for these innovations and indications, which are designed to keep competitors off the market and find new sales opportunities. Yes. The research and development goes into patent extension, as I said. So I want to look at what other money AbbVie spends doing its business. You filed 165 patents for Imbruvica. You filed patents for Humira, other drugs. 21 billion was the purchase. 2.5 billion was their R&D. Yes. And all of that R&D, as she correctly pointed out, didn't make like less of the drug work better or didn't improve the drug in any way. It was what I told you. Every single dime spent on R&D in that $2.5 billion of R&D went to finding ways to extend the patent through different delivery mechanisms, okay? Putting the same fucking drug up your asshole doesn't make it a better drug. That is not, that is not a real situation, okay? Or finding a, a, a fucking a gelled version of the drug so you can put it on as a patch can be a little helpful for people who can't swallow the drug or some shit. But ultimately, the real reason why they're doing that is so they can extend the fucking patent. Don't be a sucker. The buyout is part of the R&D. They did the research and we own them now. Exactly. ...to keep competitors off the market. How much did you spend on litigation and settlements from 2013 to 2018? Let me correct one thing that you, I think you just said. Uh, and it is not true that we didn't invest in additional indications and additional diseases. As an example, we received approval after the development work of uh, uh, graft versus host disease. Reclaiming, we also were reclaiming my time. Mr. Gonzalez, how much did you spend, did Abby spend on litigation and settlements from 2013 to 2018? Uh, I, I don't have that number off hand. We'll be happy to give it to you. Okay, $1.6 billion, $2.45 billion on R&D, $1.6 billion in litigation and settlements. What about marketing and advertising? How much does AbbVie spend on that? Uh, well, marketing and advertising, we spend about $4 billion a year. Yep, $4.71 billion. How Wait a minute, so R&D is 2.5, marketing and advertising is $4.7 billion? Hold on, make this make sense to me. I thought private, wait, I thought private pharmaceutical, uh, private healthcare, private pharmaceutical corporations, uh, at profiteering, that was, that was good. I thought that was efficient, right? Come on, guys. We're, we're making novel chemical compounds here. We're, we're cooking up drugs. We're saving people's lives, baby. Hmm. Hmm. Really interesting that he, that, that they've spent almost t double the amount on marketing and advertising. So we found out that the R&D cost was simply for patent extension. Okay. And now we find out that they spend even more money on marketing and advertising, which I'm sure lobbying costs also are uh, a part of that. Huh. How about executive compensation, 2013 to 2018? 2013 to 2018, it's probably on average about $60 million a year. Try 330. Wow. Well, you know, these guys, they are doing really hard work. They are, they are doing real hard work, so they deserve it. They deserve it. Wow, they deserve it. I hope this video helps you really understand how ghoulish and demon-like this entire industry is from top to bottom and why I feel the way I do about people that do this and, uh, and, and why I feel the way I do about even the politicians that stand in the way of changing this. And also, <coughs> on top of that, uh, why I feel extra mad when I hear demons like Ben Shapiro lie to the American public to continue this system, to continue the system that is harming people for the profit of a select few group of individuals. I know this because I personally invest in biotech companies. The amount of money that is sunk into biotech to develop like a working drug is totally crazy. And I promise you, if you remove the profit margin from these companies, there'll just be less investment in this sphere. Drug That's bullshit. It's bullshit. Also, remove it entirely. Remove the incentive of profit entirely from pharmaceuticals and let it fucking thrive, okay? He said, trust me. Why would we trust you? It's been six minutes and 38 seconds, and you have lied 13 different times. Every single point that Ben Shapiro has brought up with the, ex with the exception of one point that he argued from the opposing side, the freedom to uh, figure out how much you want to pay for drugs, okay? Every single... Every single point that he brought up was completely a falsehood. Why would we trust you at that point, Ben? You just said, trust me, that's it? That's the reason? Drugs that would have been produced just will not be produced. I'll get to more on this in just one second. First, 
I want to talk to you about Daily Wire's most trusted privacy partner. Oh, that's great, man. Thanks. Yeah. In between his, his uh, you know, American Enterprise Institute back talking points, he has to hit you with a fucking top of the hour ad break segue. Very nice. Uh, fuck you, Ben. Okay. At the top of the hour, there is a three minute ad break, though. And if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs> Anyway, here's the three-minute ad break now, chat. In order to understand why the government can't just simply name prices for drugs and then magically the price comes down, you have to see the downstream effect. The prices on those drugs will indeed come down. It's the drugs that will never be developed that are the unintended consequences. So in 2019 alone... That's really interesting. The drugs that will never be uh, developed. Hmm, that's really cool. For every made-up argument that Ben has, there is a thousand real-world examples that you could point to where companies will literally stop medical innovation dead in its tracks when a drug could potentially be used for a different purpose if the drug patent it is about to run out, okay? Psychedelic Gazelle, thank you for the 10 gifted subs. Kid Nation producer, thank you for the five gifted subs. This funny-ass name. I love that. He's like, what about all the drugs that won't exist because big pharmaceutical CEOs that aren't spending the resources in uh, finding novel chemical compounds. You know what I mean? What about, what about these fake drugs that might exist in the future? Ben, remember, has made zero arguments as to why, why pro, uh, profit-centered pharmaceutical uh, uh, manufacturers are better at innovation because there is no evidence for this. It is the exact opposite of this reality, okay? There is no drug that has not touched publicly funded institutional research. There is no novel chemical compound without public funding in facilities where these novel chemical compounds are being founded. And the United States, like I said already, is not the leading innovator in the field. Okay? Your tax dollars and grants are funding this innovation. All it takes is for one of these companies to then come in once the chemical compound has been innovated to purchase it, purchase the patent. Is there an argument that some drugs don't get made because it's against profit seeking? Yes, of course there is. And there are examples of this too. Every single pharmaceutical company, because they operate on the profit motive, will stop any kind of alternative cures, like any kind of alternative cure research if the pharmaceutical, if the, if the patent is about to expire. Every single one of them does this. The pharmaceutical industry spent $83 billion in 2019, $83 billion on R&D, research and development. According to one 2020 study, which covered 632 new therapeutic drugs and biologic agents approved by the FDA, the estimated median capitalized research and development cost per product was $985 million, counting expenditures on failed trials, which you should count because the vast majority of drugs that are originally developed never make it to market. Somewhere between 85 and 90% of all drugs that enter phase one testing never make it through FDA approval process, but they cost a lot of money. So that means that for every drug that actually hits the market, and it's not that many drugs every year, you're talking maybe like a dozen, couple dozen drugs hitting the market every year, it's costing like almost a billion, by some estimates, somewhere between 1.3 and $2.4 billion a year to develop. Wow. Seems like a lot of money has to be spent to make this happen. If only, if only, I don't know, the, the profit motive was entirely removed from this process. Develop each one of the, well, two, 1.3 and $2.4 billion to develop each one of those drugs. That's how much money these companies have to spend up front to even develop a working drug. So how do they make that money back? What makes it profitable? Why would they spend $1.3, $2.4 billion on creating a drug or risk hundreds of millions of dollars on drugs that... I don't know. If you're not a fucking demon, I have an idea. Um, so that people don't die from, from illness, you know? Uh, that's, that's an idea, I think. Also, pharmaceutical companies are not fronting this cost. Once again, like I mentioned... There you go. They're getting grants. What about Inanil Mas? Inanil Yorum. 
By the way, my dad did a new way of cooking the chicken today, and it's fucking insane. And uh, here is some uh, fried, well, not fried, but uh, I don't know what he did. I think he air fried some, some onions and peppers, too. It's so crazy. He put that shit on, man. Aren't ever going to make it out of phase three? Well, the reason is because on the other end, there has to be some sort of way to earn back that money. Now, Americans do bear the brunt of the cost because other countries are free riding. The U.S. government spends $243 billion a year on uh, pharmaceutical research versus the $83 million, uh, billion from the private sector is what that chatter said before they got clapped. The U.S. government spends $245.1 billion in 2020 on medical research versus the $83 billion from private. Lux turn a gene therapy for blindness to cost $850,000. Guys, there's nothing we can do. It just has to be this price point, you know? It is what it is. If other countries have a free ride, why do these companies even sell the drugs there? If it was at a loss, wouldn't they sell to that market at all? Ding, ding, ding. That is precisely the answer. That's why Ben is lying, like I said. But he can't admit that because when you admit that, you fucking realize how devastating shit actually is. That these major pharmaceutical corporations are already turning a profit in other marketplaces, but they just can get away with turning a much larger profit in the United States of America. They make money in Europe. They still make money when they sell it for a dollar, but in America, they get away with selling it for $10. If Ben were to say, oh, they're doing charity in Europe, he would look like a fucking idiot. But that's basically what he's saying without actually saying it. Do you understand? And it's bullshit. It's not real. We also captured the industry upside. It used to be in the 1970s that a huge percentage of drugs were actually developed in Europe. Today, a huge percentage of drugs are developed in the United States. According to one 2010 study. That's so funny. Again, he's doing, okay. Remember, God, I've already, dude, in, a lot of people were saying, Hassan, why did you pause so much in the beginning? Because I already addressed all of these points. Like, I, I addressed every single point because I knew exactly what he was going to say. So I addressed basically every single point ahead of time. Okay? The percentage of novel chemical compounds is a total, totality argument. A percentage of novel chemical compounds being created in the United States is meaningless if you are talking about efficiency. Which country is generating more novel chemical compounds with less money? Because Ben is talking about efficiency here. He's saying that more public funding is actually bad or rather more private funding is actually good and these guys have to dump a lot of private funds, which isn't even the case. And that... The profit motive is the reason why people are making these uh, medical innovations. It's not true. So what he's going to do now is tell you that a higher percentage of the novel chemical compounds are founded in the United States. That part is true. Of course it's true. There are more institutions, more facilities, more money, more people in the United States of America. Okay? That's why you have to adjust it to per capita. The United States accounted for 42% of prescription drug spending and 40% of total GDP among innovator countries and was responsible for 43.7% of what are called NMEs, new molecular entities. According to the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the pharmaceutical and medicine manufacturing industry is responsible for about 332,000 jobs in the United States. In other words, it's a big business. And it's a big business because... He immediately moved away. He just dropped that in there as though that's relevant in the argument. Brother, brother, that is such a fucking stupid argument to make. If your goal is to talk about, if your goal is to talk about how efficient America is at, at uh, cultivating novel chemical compounds, you can't turn around and say America is responsible for a lot of medical innovation. 43% of all medical innovation, novel chemical compounds are happening in the United States of America. Okay, that's because the money is here. That's because the doctors are here. That's because there's more people here. And even in the United States of America, the majority, the overwhelming majority, as a matter of fact, in medical development still comes from public funding. If that was the case, European uh, uh, pharmaceutical or European novel chemical compound development would be much worse than the United States of America if, there, you know, if there's not enough profit motive there. Anyway, having said that, he moved immediately away from the totality argument. He just dropped it in there, snuck that in there, and then talked about jobs, 
Okay? Jobs. Okay. Yeah, it's a big industry. So what? So the fuck what? Who cares? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a big industry. I guess like, uh, you know, uh, the the uh, industry of, of uh, killing old people is going to continue to thrive because it hires a lot of people. Are you making an argument? Oh, the government... Are you making an argument for a, a inefficient business to continue existing? What are you, a fucking socialist? What is this shit? This is a very childish idea, the idea that people have to do and create drugs for just for the sake of doing something good instead of winning more money. And the idea that the state can one day do this better than private companies is also a, a childish idea. Brother, it's only a childish idea if you're a fucking idiot. Because what you just described as a childish idea is objective fact. That is what I'm describing to you. You're so fucking baby brain that you don't even understand that that is literally what is the reality and this guy is lying to you. Okay? It's so frustrating that there are still people who choose to debate this point and they are just in the wrong. Like, they're not even right. There is, they are objectively in the wrong. And I have given you multiple points of data at this point. How much money uh, the United States public funding uh, goes into uh, novel chemical compound research, uh, uh, development, and what kind of R and D uh, funds are are actually t just wasted on patent extension mechanisms? But Hassan, you don't get a fam. You're the one saying it, so now it's just not true. Actually, yeah, because there's actual freedom of pricing in the United States. So what exactly would happen if Medicare gets away with cramming down this pricing structure? According to National Review's Jeff Zimira, drug development would drop off. And that's not according to him. It's according to the CBO. The Congressional Budget Office has predicted the scheme provided for under the Inflation Reduction Act would lead to a manufactured revenue loss of 15%. Such a cut in CBO's predicted 45 new drugs per year would suggest around seven fewer drugs per year. That means 121 drugs lost over an 18-year time horizon, as one report estimated. So which drugs would be most likely to disappear? The drugs most likely to disappear would actually be the ones that are for rare conditions, right? The ones that have less of a profit margin to begin with. Those drugs would just go away. So you can forget about- Yeah, except, you know, if we were to lower pharmaceutical prices to like European standards, it's very clear that they still make money. So how does that work? I was wrong before 245 billion was overall spent, 61 billion from the federal government and 16 billion from academic institutions. Yes, but the 83 billion they're talking about in private investments are also going into academic institutions. You're funding publicly funded research facilities. The R&D money that is coming from is put into two categories. One, uh, donations that are being made to these uh, publicly funded research institutions so they can continue making these, uh, so they can continue making novel chemical, com novel chemical compound development. Okay. True innovation in the pharmaceutical uh, field. And then the other side, the R&D for patent extension. It's two separate categories. As also, also, drugs for rare diseases are subsidized by separate federal programs, which Ben also ignores. Yes. He's wrong anyways. We have the Orphan Drug Act to help with rare disease states. Huh. The funniest part about this is that we haven't even gotten to the morality of the situation because he's so objectively incorrect on the facts that we haven't even gotten to, like, the should- people make money off of this. I don't believe so. I don't think so. But I guess, ultimately, ultimately, because, uh, because all of his facts are incorrect on why, you know, you don't even need to get to that point. But yes, it is pure evil for, uh, uh, for people to make money off of uh, selling people things that they need to survive. It is evil. It's just wrong. It's immoral. And turns out quite inefficient as well. A drug's being developed for the rare condition that your mother just got diagnosed with. Those are just not going to be in the market anymore because who the hell's going to develop them if there's no money on the other end? There's another solution to this, by the way. That solution would be to aggressively make other countries pay their fair share when it comes to American medication. We could use every lever at our disposal in order to do that. And this is where a trade war would actually be somewhat useful. Saying to Canada, or saying to the... <laughs> Dude, imagine going to... That would be so funny, because that would literally... <clears throat> if anything threatens American hegemonic power, it's that. 
That's so funny. He said, he said that the United States of America should force other nations on the planet to pay American prices for their pharmaceuticals. This is such a childish, it, it's evil, it's pure evil, but it's also so childishly, so comically evil. You know what I mean? It's like, like good luck. Lazan, if I paid for higher premiums, so should other people. Ben is 100% correct. Fuck the government. I want it privatized. <laughs> According to a 2021 study by the Rand Corporation, nonprofit global policy think tank prices of prescription drugs in the U.S. are 2.4 times higher than the average prices of nine other nations. That higher cost is largely related to brand name drugs, which are 4.9 times more expensive in the U.S. than in those other countries. In fact, brand name drugs are responsible for 84% of total drugs in the United States, despite accounting for only 8% of drugs dispensed. This also is a relatively favorable study that makes uh, pharmaceutical corporations look good or better. Hey, Asanabi, I'm a research chemist at a university that does research to develop therapeutics for cancer. You said the entire industry is corrupt and evil to the bottom. I'm not sure how the development innovation research side of things is evil. I do understand that it's incredibly fucked up that most pharma companies' practices are in their business side, but I don't really see what's wrong with my work. Um, chatter, I really hope your brain doesn't work this poorly when you're unironically doing your fucking uh, research because never did I ever in any capacity say that, you know, universities that are developing new therapeutics for cancer are the bad guys here. What the fuck are you saying? I'm specifically talking about research and development in the private sector that doesn't directly go into offering donations to these in, uh, research institutes are going to extending patents. All matter of R&D... Once a novel chemical compound is found, once a delivery mechanism is adopted, once a patent is delivered, once the company purchases that patent, okay, or purchases the other, you know, smaller company that uh, uh, played a role in creating that patent, they are using all matter of funds on the R&D side on Patent extension mechanisms, like different delivery mechanisms, different delivery systems. They're not structurally modifying the chemical in any capacity. All they're trying to do is ensure that uh, uh, copycat drugs are not available. That's it. Of course I'm not talking about fucking research chemists at the university. What is happening? And then an even larger chunk of it is going into marketing anyway. Pharmaceutical companies also allocate retained earnings and other financial resources to R&D and shareholder payouts. Companies depend on profits to sustain biopharmaceutical investments. This declaration creates the impression that profits finance R&D. Clearly, this conclusion does not generalize, since many innovative emerging pharmaceutical manufacturers bring new drugs to market prior to collecting any revenues. Recent analyses of industry balance sheets also reveal a more complicated picture. The average percent of global revenue accounted for by shareholder payouts from 2009 to 2018 was 29%, or 106% of net income. Shareholder payments include stock buybacks and dividend payments. The average percent of global revenue accounted for by R&D was 17%, or 93% of net income. Thus, for the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, R&D plus shareholder payouts sum to 199% of net income. Clearly, R&D is not being funded primarily by retained earnings. Debt during the 2009-2018 period for over-the-top 18 firms averaged around 58% of global revenues, or over 200% of net income. Debt, is, debt has more than doubled since 2009, suggesting that there is more to R&D funding than simple retained earnings. The National Health Service. You guys are going to pay American companies what we here in the United States pay. And we are going to use the levers at our disposal in order to make that happen. He's saying that we're going to strong arm countries. Because right now, basically, America is subsidizing the rest of the world when it comes to drug creation. But the solution to that isn't for American government to then cram down a pricing mechanism on the big... This isn't true. Guys, I just want to point something out. Two things. Hi, you're David All right. If that was the case, then pharmaceutical corporations would, sim would, first of all, if that was the case, then they would not be making profit in, like, the European market, right? But then a patent, distribu patent for distribution of a certain brand drug would have to be maintained by the same company internationally so that they could leverage. So that they could leverage the low prices 
against the high prices in the United States. However, distribution patents are separate, oftentimes owned by separate pharmaceutical corporations. Distribution patents for the United States and Canada are separate than distribution patents for the rest of the international market, with some exceptions in Japan. If there was this subsidization happening in the way that Ben claims it is, then they would have to be owned by the same company. So how can they subsidize if different companies are the ones who are distributing the fucking drugs internationally versus the United States of America? Secondly, so that's wrong on that front. Secondly, if it was the case that these companies were not making profits, then why are they selling at the price point? Now that we've addressed that, why are they selling at that price point to Mexico? Why are they selling at that price point to Europe? Why are they selling? Are they doing it because they're kind? Are they doing it because they're nice? Are they doing it for those reasons? No, they are still making profits in those countries. Okay, they're still making profits in those countries. And not only that, but there are instances where these companies demand a certain price for a certain uh, uh, product, for a certain pharmaceutical, and the government says, no, this is our price, we won't budge, so they don't sell those drugs in that marketplace. Certain drugs you cannot access in different countries, okay? That's just the case. It's really evil, it's gross, that there is no better uh, defense mechanism against this kind of uh, pure profit-seeking. But if Ben was right, they would sell all those drugs. They would just sell other drugs in Europe at a cheaper uh, price point because they're not doing it for profit at that point. They're doing it out of the kindness of their hearts or because they're getting subsidized in America. So how does that work? Why is it that certain drugs that are available to, uh, to, to uh, purchase in a pharmacy in Germany, for example, are no longer available in the pharmacy because the government is no longer purchasing uh, said drugs because the manufacturer has raised the prices and won't budge. So that's why you can't get Adderall in Japan. No, Jap uh, Japan's ban on Adderall has uh, nothing to do with prices and everything to do with, uh, with uh, Japan's addiction to meth uh, post-World War II. Uh, anyway. Pharma companies and the drug companies and the medicine companies, well, when you do that, you just get rid of all the innovation. Imagine for a second, if the United States in any other industry decided that we were just going to ratchet down cost supposed government cost on any other area of American life. I take the tech sector or, or take the financial sector. We're just going to ratchet up taxation. And we're going to do so in order to lower, supposedly, the cost to the American taxpayer. We're just going to tax that particular sector. What do you think happens? People flee. The innovation goes away. This is simple supply and demand kind of stuff. When you get... Wait, I don't get it. Wait, Ben. First of all, there's no evidence for this, but... Wait, I'm sorry. Guys, Ben just said... People will flee if we tax the pharmaceutical sector too much. And the question I have is, where are they going to flee? To Europe? Where they're already apparently not profitable? Where are they going to flee, Ben? We're the suckers. We're the only country on the fucking planet that's paying 10x the prices for the same pharmaceuticals. Where are they going to go? Are they going to sell drugs on the moon? What the fuck are you saying? This doesn't even make sense from the own twisted, like completely made up logic structure that he is trying to present. If America is going to uh, refuse to bend the will of pharmaceutical corporations, where are they going to sell? Australia? They're paying way less. They're going to go to Mexico? They're paying way less. They're going to Brazil? Or maybe they'll go to Uranus rid of the profit margin in a particular product line, there is less innovation, there's less investment in that area. It's very simple. But Joe Biden doesn't care about that. He cares about the top line look that he's bringing down cost. The lost innovation is of no consequence to him whatsoever. Because when it comes to Bidenomics, second order thinking is completely irrelevant. It's all first order thinking. I don't like the price of that drug. Therefore, I will use government to cram down a new price on that drug. Sure, it means that a bunch of drugs aren't going to participate in Medicare. You're still going to have to get them over the counter. Sure, it means that you are going to lose the innovation by these companies. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. They're going to participate in Medicare. Or else they're going to get taxed 95%. It's simple, man. 
hate to admit it, but this is a, a fucking fat Brandon W. Only issue I have is it's not expansive enough. Simple, Jack. They gotta participate. They gotta cut the malarkey, Jack. I looked them dead in the eyes. I said, Jack, gotta work. Or else, you're gonna have to pay 95% in taxes. That's why he's chirping so much. That's why he's so mad right now. To him whatsoever. Also, when it comes to Biden. This video, I suspect, is not as big as a banger as Ben thought it was going to be. But I feel like he has to do this. I disagree with Ben on this issue. I am someone who has had medical issues my whole life, and I find it strange how life-saving drugs are out of reach for most people due to cost. The only thing we're extraordinarily good at is making things more difficult and more expensive than necessary. Nice to know our educators uh, know their history. Really nice. Enough said. This guy is a fucking idiot. But look. Look at this. He's getting ass-fucked by his own YouTube comments. You want to know why? Because Americans might be stupid. Americans might be fat. Americans might be lazy. Americans might be selfish. But a, but a combination of all of those things mean Americans need medication and they're getting ass-fucked on a daily basis. They have personally seen it. Not every conservative knows a trans person, but every conservative has a family member or themselves that is in desperate need of some kind of reform in a pharmaceutical pricing. Okay? That's right. We are a nation of diabetics. Good luck trying to tell your own audience or any audience in the United States of America that you keep having to pay 10x the prices for the same fucking drugs that you can get in Mexico much cheaper. Economics, second order thinking is completely irrelevant. It's all first order thinking. I don't like the price of that drug. Therefore, I will use government to cram down a new price on that drug. Sure, it means that a bunch of drugs aren't going to participate in Medicare. You're still going to have to get them over to the counter. Sure, it means that you are going to lose the innovation by these companies or have them base themselves somewhere else. But at least you'll feel good about having supposedly brought down the cost. By the way, like Democrats care about the cost of Medicare. Since when have Democrats cared about the cost of Medicare? They won't even restructure Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, which represents 66% of the American mandatory budget every year. Anytime anybody mentions, maybe we should restructure those programs in order to lower the cost. They're like, no, 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 we can't touch it. Apparently, the only way to touch it is to confiscate money and innovation from the private sector. Yeah. 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 For far too long, they've gotten away with this shit. Yeah, confiscate it. You fucking bitch. It's called taxes. How about these fucking pharmaceutical CEOs start paying their fair share? Fucking piece of shit. Dumb donkey. Imagine making a 46-minute video talking about how CEOs, pharmaceutical companies, shouldn't be paying their fucking fair share and, could con- and should be able to freely shellac the American population so that their shareholders can make a tidy profit at the end of the, every quarter. Get the fuck out of here, dude. No way. For the first time, the federal government is prepared to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies over the price of some very popular... This is what we were talking about earlier. Uh, Biden administration has announced 10 drugs targeted for Medicare price negotiation. Let's take a look. For their drugs under Medicare. This is part of President Biden's plan to lower prescription drug costs, part of the Inflation Reduction Act passed by Congress last year. Weijia Zhang joins us now from the White House with more on this. Weijia, good morning. Good morning, Tony. Good morning to everybody. You're right. This fall, the agency that runs Medicare will start haggling to get a better price for 10 widely used medications. But critics, including lobbying groups and Republicans, are fighting the negotiations. There are at least eight lawsuits aiming to block them. Catherine Bristol's diabetes medication costs up to $200 a month. She says sometimes that means she can't afford to buy groceries. I shouldn't have to choose between my medicine to keep me not going blind, not eating or dipping into my rent. Bristol takes Genuvia. 
one of 10 drugs that could be cheaper after negotiations between the government and drug manufacturers. They are used to treat a range of illnesses, including heart failure, blood clots, and arthritis. A new report shows about 9 million seniors in Medicare's prescription drug program used one or more of the drugs last year, paying $3.4 billion out of pocket. We're going to keep standing up to Big Pharma, and we're not going to back down. President Biden announced the plan for price cuts as part of his inflation reduction plan. But the top pharmaceutical trade group, Pharma, called it short-term political gain rather than what is best for patients. Yeah, what's best for patients is like uh, not being able to pay for it because they get to dictate what the what the prices should be. Pharma has joined the legal battle to block the program. The White House... I'm not even joking when I say... Okay, I, I don't want to say it. I don't want to say it. I don't want to say what I want to say, what you should be able to do to these people, okay? But I'm thinking it. You can't stop me from thinking it, okay? You should think it. It's fine to think that. I think if you're doing that, if you're a, a, a fucking lobbyist, okay, if you're working for a special interest group like this one, and your job is to, like, block the tiny marginal improvement made upon uh, the lives of millions of fucking seniors, okay? I I think you should have bad things happen. I think you should go to jail. I think jail would be like if given the option you would prefer being in jail than than the other thing, you know what I mean? Like that's all I'm saying. It's just it's it's very 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 frustrating to see uh people so openly behave uh in a manner that that every single human being can understand is parasitic. It's just, I don't know. House insists it has the authority to move forward. Medicare's ability to ne negotiate drug prices is clear in the law. Newly <laughs> love, love Nira Tandon, by the way. Great, great person on the job. Uh, great person on the job. Uh, dedicated poster. Absolute freak. Uh, literally lost out on a position that she uh, wanted to get in the administration because she couldn't get... She quite literally could not get appointed uh, to a, a to a position in the administration, or was it appointed to a position in the administration due to uh, uh, the the posts that she had engaged in? It's uh, fucking awesome. She's a true poster. It's a gross post by Felix. Oh. I mean, this is not enough. It's just a good start. It's a good start. I can't believe it took this long. Negotiated drug prices are set to be released next year, with lower prices going into effect in 2026. Bristol says better late than never. It's about time that the medicine becomes available to people old that we can afford it. Drug companies have until October 1st to agree to enter into negotiations. Otherwise, they face an excise tax of up to 95% or will be forced to withdraw from Medicare and Medicaid altogether. Prices for additional drugs are expected to go down in the coming years. Tony. I don't understand one thing. The American government is so fucking powerful, okay? It's so powerful. It does, like, basically genocide almost all around the world, okay? It's got its tentacles and everything. How the fuck do you just let pharmaceutical executives live freely like this? You know what I mean? How do you let that happen? Like, at the very least, sick the goddamn IRS on them and their fucking families. You know what I mean? Put the fear of God in their, in their lives a little bit. It's very, very frustrating that the Democratic Party is not doing enough. You know what I mean? I know it's because they give them money. It's like uh, they're in bed with one another, but it's just like very frustrating to me that that is the case. What? Why would you put your own kids behind bars? I know, I know, I know. It's just like so, so frustrating. Because they run a classic shakedown. Nice drugs you have there. Shame if there were anything that happened to them. Better pay up. But here's the thing. A lot of this is bullshit. Okay, a lot of this conversation is just bullshit. The real reason is because those guys fund the government. Those guys are responsible for every single person that's in a, in a position of power. 
They've been funding them since day one. Their sons and daughters go and, and, and work in these corporations. It's a revolving door. That's the only reason why no real change happens. Okay? No, no real change happens in this regard, right? It's just never going to change. There's nothing you can do about it. Now, I don't I don't even know where to begin. I don't know where to I don't know where to start. I don't know where to begin. I don't know where to fucking uh to to start solving this issue. You know what I mean? I don't know. This is literally how it is with every aspect of the government. Why are you surprised by this? I'm not surprised by it. I just I'm tired. That's it. That's all I'm saying. Uh, Ouija, thank you very much. Uh, this is kind of a big deal because Medicare is a huge part of the federal budget. We are all paying for it with our taxes. Right. But what Big Pharma is saying on the flip side is also interesting. They're saying we need this money in order to keep innovating. So, you know, time will tell uh, who's on the better side of this. But right. So it's a big move. But it consumers is. just want to pay less for the drug. Absolutely. Right. At the end of so the day. At right. the end of the day, that's all anybody cares about. That is about. exactly right. I mean, it's it's basically a, it's a win-win. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it other than that. It's just a win-win-win. Uh, it's a good situation. It's good policy. The only issue that I would have with it is that it's like basically the uh, the the policy is not broad enough. The coverage is not broad enough. I wish it was broader, but it's a good start, I guess. I don't know. But those innovations come from government subsidies, but go on. Uh, yes, it is.